How's it everyone who's watching this? This is my 7th video on the channel, and today we're going to be continuing the 3rd section of Ferdinand de Saussure's course in General Linguistics, titled Synchronic Linguistics. Last time, we looked a bit at synchronic identity and value, using a myriad of chess-based metaphors along the way. In this episode, we're going to polish off synchronic linguistics, with 4 more chapters. Firstly, syntagmatic and associative relations, followed by the mechanism of language, then grammar and its subdivisions, and lastly, but not all leastly, role of abstract entities in grammar. He begins the first chapter, split up into three subchapters, by asking how relations in synchronic language states function. In his eyes, there are two classes of relations and differences, which he refers to as syntagmatic and associative. Of this first kind of relations, Saussure states, in discourse, on the one hand, words acquire relations based on the linear nature of language, because they are chained together. When Saussure speaks of syntagms, this is what he's referring to. Syntagms are any compositions of two or more related units connected in a linear chain. For example, the word reread is a syntagm of the prefix re and the verb read. Sentences like I like peaches are also syntagms. Words in them only gain meaning because of their opposition to other parts of a syntagm. This kind of relationship is built on difference. This is separate from what Saussure terms as associative relations. These exist outside of discourse, in other words, in the mind of an individual. Discussing them, he says, Those that have something in common are associated in the memory, resulting in groups marked by diverse relations. They are what allows us to connect words like teacher to education. They differ quite strikingly from syntagmatic relations, and Saussure states that they belong to the mind, the warehouse that stores language in each speaker. This takes us to the next subchapter, focusing on syntagmatic relationships. The main purpose of the section is to clear up whether syntagms belong to language proper or to Bechol, in other words, to speech. Saussure starts out by highlighting that syntagms apply to more than just words, but to groups of words and complex units of all kinds, such as compound words, phrases, and whole sentences. He goes on to offer his first argument for why syntagms belong to language. It is obvious from the first that many expressions belong to language. These are the set phrases in which any change is prohibited by usage, even if we can single out their meaningful elements. Take idioms like it's a piece of cake, for example. They aren't improvised, but rather are borrowed from tradition. In other words, they come from the storehouse of language. Further, he says that syntagmatic relations are only possible due to configurations allowed by language. We're able to say things like the earth turns because of language giving us a grammatical framework to do so. Ending the section, he warns, however, that there's a fine line between syntagms language, and Bechol. This takes us swiftly to the last subchapter, associative relations. Unlike with syntagmatic relations, which are built upon difference, Saussure begins the section by stating that associative relations rely on things in common. This can be due to a repeated part of a term, such as in the case of words teacher, to teach, and we teach, or due to similarities between signifiers or concepts in the case of teaching, education, and tutoring. Additionally, they can th form due to the use of the same suffix, or because of similarities in the signifier, the sound image. In Saussure's words, There is at times a double similarity of meaning and form, at times similarity only of form or of meaning. A word can always evoke everything that can be associated with it, one way or another. Unlike syntagms, which have a definite number of terms, the terms in a sentence, for example, and a set linear order, associative relations are vast and unpredictable. Any particular word is like the center of a constellation, he says, the point of convergence of a multitude of different terms, something he seeks to demonstrate with this illustration. The constellation is indefinite because of just how vast language is and has an indeterminate order, due to just how unpredictable the mind is. Just think of the psychoanalytic technique of free association. 
a clear example of associative relations in practice. However, this first characteristic isn't completely verifiable. This is because there do exist non-indefinite associative grouping, like in the case of inflections in languages that have case systems. However, he argues, these groupings are still ordered indeterminately. Don't think in terms of solely the nominative case, then decline from there, after all. How one grammarian decides to order declension chart is completely arbitrary. With this, he ends chapter 5 and moves on to the next, titled The Mechanism of Language. This chapter is also split into three subsections, the first among them being syntagmatic solidarities. He begins by stating, What is the most striking in the organization of language are syntagmatic solidarities. Almost all units of language depend on what surrounds them in the spoken chain. How he shows this is with the example of word formation. Take the word painful. It can be separated into two subunits, pain and full. However, by themselves, they aren't just two units lumped together. Full means nothing by itself. Instead, painful is a product of two interdependent parts, the two subunits. In his eyes, this sort of relationship between a unit and a subunit holds true for all syntagms. However, he ends the subchapter by stating that there are some exceptions to this general principle, where there are units that don't have syntagmatic relationships with other units or subunits, words like yes and no. To Saussure, uh, these exceptions, though, shouldn't mean that we should throw away the general principle that he views as governing language. He ends the section by explaining that we don't communicate through inter independent signs, but rather through groupings. This now takes us into the next subchapter, titled Simultaneous Functioning of the Two Types of Groupings. The section is about just what the title says. His focus is on showing how syntagmatic and associative relations can overlap. He uses the French word de faire meaning undo, as an example. As shown in this diagram, the word is a syntagm composed of de and faire, released along a linear line, that of time. This isn't all, however. In this diagram, it looks at another axis, an unconscious one, where we find associative relations. De, meaning un and undo, recalls words like unstick, displace, and unravel. Faire recalls its root, meaning do, along with redo. Without these associations, de faire would fall apart. The two subunits that syntagmatically make it up only get their meaning from associative relations. Thus, says Saussure, the functioning of a dual system becomes apparent. In his words, Our memory holds in reserve all the more or less complex types of syntagms, and we bring in the associative groups to fix our choice when the time for using them arrives. His example of this is a Frenchman saying marchant, meaning let's walk. When he says this, he's also unconsciously thinking of all the associations that converge on the syntagm. For example, the other forms of a verb marcher, along with words like montant and mangeant, let's get up and let's eat respectively. It's through this system of oppositions and relations that he's able to express what he means. In Zersuch's eyes, it's a mistake, or rather a simplification, to say that the French man simply picks out a word. By itself, no signification can occur. It's only through the latent system he evokes that it's possible to mean something. This takes us to the last section of the chapter, titled Absolute and Relative Arbitrariness. Here, he seeks to present the mechanism of language from another perspective, the angle of arbitrariness, as the title suggests. There are multiple levels of arbitrariness, he says. All signs are arbitrary, but some are radically so, in his words, unmotivated, whilst others are less so. The words vent, meaning 20, and 19, 19, are both arbitrary, but the prior more so relative to the latter. This is because the latter recalls other terms to it, like dies, then, and neuf, nine. The same thing happens with the word like teacher, which recalls teach and the suffix er. However, arbitrariness never disappears. The components that make up Dijsnuf are just as arbitrary as Vong by themselves. However, 
so Zurich sees it as paramount to try and study linguistics from a viewpoint of limiting arbitrariness. This can be done, firstly, through syntagmatic relations, like dies and ne, and secondly, through associative ones. The words that surround these ne, like dies huit and dies set, it's 18 and 17 respectively. If language is viewed solely through the lens of being purely arbitrary, it would be almost unstudiable. By applying this new lens of relations, that, for the most part, disappears as a problem. Now puts down a distinction between languages that are lexicological, in other words, languages that are more arbitrary, and languages that are quote-unquote grammatical, those which relatively aren't. These act as two extremes, that the whole system of language wavers between. Explain what he means by grammatical and lexicological, Saussure says this. The tendency to use the lexicological instrument, the unmotivated sign, and the preference given to the grammatical instrument, structural rules. Different languages exist on different points between these two poles. To help picture what he means, use the example of Chinese as an uber-lexicological language, and Sanskrit as an uber-grammatical one. This takes us to chapter 7, Grammar and its Subdivisions. He splits this into only two sections, beginning with definitions, traditional divisions. Saussure's goal here is to ask if a traditional conception of grammar as containing morphology and syntax but excluding lexicology, or the study of words, is valid. He starts by asking if these divisions fit the principles that he has just described. He looks first at morphology and syntax. He defines the prior as the study of different classes of words, like nouns, verbs, and adjectives, whilst the latter concerns itself with the functions attached to the forms morphology deals with. However, Saussure attacks the notion that these two fields are distinct. His example, and again, apologies for the pronunciation, is the Greek word pula, or phula, meaning guardian. Using the traditional division, morphology simply states that the word's genitive form is phulakos, while syntax explains the different uses of the two forms, the latter referring to possession. However, Saussure says, it's simply an illusion that these two things are separated. Form and functions are interdependent in his eyes, since the series of forms that make up a word's morphological paradigm stem directly from their functions. This takes him to the exclusion of lexicology from grammar. At first glance, it might not seem like the words lend themselves to grammatical study. However, as Saussure states, We notice at once that innumerable relations may be expressed as efficiently by words as by grammar. He lists quite a few examples. But the one I find clearest is that of how it's possible to interchange words and phrases in language. For example, the same general idea can be expressed both through the words avenge and take revenge on, or consider and take into consideration. His final conclusion for the subchapter is that although it may be practically useful to have these grammatical divisions, it would be a grave mistake to consider them as some kind of natural distinctions. Now, we arrive at the second section, titled Rational Divisions. Essentially, the old system of grammatical systems ought to be thrown out, since every synchronic fact is identical. Instead, the only possible point of departure is that of associative and syntagmatic relations, Saussure saying, Immediately, certain parts of traditional grammar would seem to fall effortlessly into one category or the other. For example, Inflection is based on associative relations in the mind of a speaker, while syntax falls into the category of syntagms, where, although not all syntagmatic facts are syntactical, all syntactic facts are syntagmatic. Although he's unable to build more on this idea since these are only introductory lecture notes, Saussure states that these are the two axes grammar must be built upon. This takes us to the final chapter of a whole section of synchronic linguistics, the role of abstract entities in grammar. Here, he considers just that, first considering them associatively and then syntagmatically. He starts out by saying that associating different forms is more than just feeling that they have something in common. That is, also involves singling out the nature of relations that govern associations. Saussure's example is that speakers are able to differentiate the relationship between teach and teaching from something like teaching and judging. In his eyes, this is how the system of associations is tied to grammar. To clarify, 
This is because associations are what set up word families, inflectional paradigms and formative elements, like suffixes and roots, in our mind. However, more than just the material elements that make up sound images, associations also exist on a conceptual level. For example, that's what allows us to connect gentle forms together, something quite of interest to what traditionally is referred to as syntax. All of these things exist as abstract entities in language. What that means is that they are difficult to study as it's hard to tell whether or not the average speaker's conception of them matches that of a grammarian's analysis. However, this is nuanced by the fact that every grammatical abstraction is based on something concrete, the material elements that serve as their basis. Here, he moves on to the syntagmatic point of view. Saussure begins with this claim. The value of a cluster is often linked to the order of its elements. The example he gives is other words painful and signify. We can't just reorganize them into full pain and I signif. The value is based on how they unfurl syntagmatically. Additionally, separate from concrete elements, grammatical value can be encoded syntagmatically, such as in the difference between the phrases I must and must I? Word order is undoubtedly an abstract entity, he states, but it's fully based on the concrete units that play out syntagmatically. He ends the entire section, synchronic linguistics, by stating that a material unit exists only through its meaning and function, but that conversely, meaning and function also exist only through some sort of material form. This concludes the second half of synchronic linguistics from Ferdinand de Saussure's course in general linguistics. I truly hope you enjoyed or learned something, and if you feel I got anything wrong, please do feel free to let me know in the comments so I can do better next time. Next, we'll start the next section of the book, focusing on diachronic linguistics. Until then, bye!